So we're just going to let everybody in and we are ready to start. So welcome. Uh, good morning and good afternoon and good evening to all our participants worldwide. First of all, uh, please note that your microphones have been muted to ensure that it's good sound throughout the whole session. Uh, we ask that you keep them this way uh, so we don't have any background noise. Uh, and just to let you know that we're streaming this event live on Facebook and we'll also be publishing it through our YouTube channel where you can also follow our past and our future uh, online activities. If uh, someone does not want to appear on the actual recording, you can obviously turn your camera off. At the end of the panel presentations, we will be taking questions from our audience. So feel free to, to use the, the chat at the bottom of your screen to write all your questions for our panelists. Uh, we shall try our best to get to as many questions as we possibly can. My name is uh, Nuria Levy, and I am the Program Director of Innovation and Entrepreneurship here at the Golda Meir Mashaf Carmel Training Center. And also with me is... Hello, everyone. I'm Tamar, and I'm the Director of Gender and Technology at MCTC. Thank you. Now, MCTC was founded uh, in Haifa in 1961 by Mashaf, the Israeli Agency for International Development and Cooperation, part of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to conduct training activities in the socio-economic arena with emphasis on gender equality. Today, we bring you a first-class panel to discuss the advancements of women and girls in science on the occasion of International Day of Women and Girls in Science 2022, which actually just took place last Friday, the 11th of February. But before uh, we introduce our experts, we would like to welcome our ambassador, Einat Schlein, head of Mashaf, to open today's session. Ambassador, welcome. The microphone is all yours. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? I hope you can. Yeah, I'm not on mute. Can anybody comment? All good. We can hear you. Yeah. Good. We yeah, can hear we can me. Hear Wonderful. Right Wonderful. You know, these days one should ask, otherwise you find yourself speaking to yourself or to the to the wall in front of you. So uh, good morning, good evening, and good day to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you for joining us for this wonderful uh, event, another wonderful event of, uh, um, of MCTC. I'm just saying my colleagues at MCTC, for some reason, um, I'm asked to admit all the participants and I can't speak and admit at the same time. So please take this function away from me. Thank you. So um, International Day of Women and Girls in Science was established already in 2015 in order to recognize the role of women and girls in science, not only as beneficiaries, but also as agents of change. Science and gender equality are both vital for the achievement of the internationally agreed development, uh, development goals, including the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Over the past decades, the global community has made a lot of effort in inspiring and engaging women and girls in science. Yet women and girls continue to be excluded from, participate, from um, fully participating uh, in science. According to UN Women, only 33% of researchers are women. They are, they are awarded less research funding than men and are less likely to be promoted. In the private sector and tech index industries, women are underrepresented in company leadership and, other, and, and in technical roles. Today, our global community faces vast challenges and it is going to take a great effort and utilize all our resources to meet those challenges. Issues such as climate change, pandemics, and more require the full participation and leadership of women and girls in all aspects of science and technology. It is time to recognize women's contribution and put aside stereotypes. Today, we're going to hear from some amazing Israeli scientists and together we will explore the important issues facing women in the world of science. Because after all, if we want to uh, get to the moon, we need to start somewhere. And uh, men have stepped on the moon, women just in space, but uh, hopefully we can all get there together and with uh, a, a much um, 
with a better participation, with the vast with vast participation of women in, uh, in the current times and girls, which, which will grow into the scientific community in the future, we can get uh, to the moon and much further. Thank you. I hope you'll enjoy this wonderful panel. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador, for your words. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, we would like we would like uh, now to give the microphone uh, to MCTC Director Sarah Wilner. Thank you, thank you very much. So uh, I would just like to thank everyone for joining us today on this special day. Um, as uh, Noria said, MCTC was founded in 1961 by Prime Minister Golda Meir and by our founding director, Mina Bensvi, and was created to conduct training activities in the socioeconomic arena with an emphasis on gender equality. So gender being the cross-cutting issue in our courses and one of our founding principles of our institution, we offer various courses on empowerment of women and social change. And we stress the importance of bottom-up development and the recognition of women's contributions to their country's development. And as Ambassador Natchlein said, today in honor of the International Day of Women and Girls in Science, we are proud to be holding a panel with top women scientists to highlight their important contribution to the field. I'd like to thank Ambassador Natchlein, head of Meshav, who's here with us today and who opened this panel. Um, I'd also like to be, give a very big thank you to our staff, Nouria and Tamar, for organizing uh, this important event. And of course, a huge thank you to our panelists who are here to share their experience. I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you, Noria. Thank you so much, Sarah. So our panelists are Professor Edith Shahar, uh, Dr. Sharon Rashi El Keles, uh, Dr. Irit Yanif, and Dr. Shimri Maman. But before we hear from our distinguished panelists, my colleague Tamar has a short presentation to highlight some of the vital aspects surrounding this International Day. So hello everyone, again, my name is uh, Tamar. I want to thank Ambassador Inet Schlein and Sarah for your delightful introduction. I'm Tamar and I'm the Director of Gender and Technology at MCT again. I hold a master's degree from the Hebrew University, magna cum laude, where I wrote my thesis on woman empowerment through learning how to code and I still research the empowerment of women through learning STEM fields. STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So today I aim to give a very brief global overview on the status of women in science. Because we have a limited time, because we are limited with time, I will try to cover it up and hope you will follow up with, with me well. So many women made implicit impact through history in the fields of science. Among them was Mary Curie, a physicist and chemist best known for her contributions to radioactivity. Maria Mayer, physicist who received Nobel Prize for suggesting the nuclear shell model of the, the, of the atomic nucleus, and Elizabeth Blackwell, American physician, who was the first woman to become a medical doctor in the United States, and many others. So now let's shed some light on female education performance in STEM. This graph, graph shows student GPA in high school in math and science combined over time by gender, High school girls now also earn higher GPAs in math and science and on, on average than their male counterparts. And this figure shows the percentage of employed STEM professionals who are women in selected fields, while women made up more than half of, of biological scientists in, in 2008. They accounted for less than 7% of mechanical engineering. So although the trends for girls and women participation are performance and performance in STEM fields are positive, women remain underrepresented in certain STEM fields. And it is important that we continue to pay attention to this issue. The fact that there are highly, there are relatively highly high percentage of females graduates in STEM fields compared to the representation in the STEM workforce is often referred to as the leaky pipeline. So what might, might be the factors influencing girls and women's participation, progression, and achievement in STEM education? I will go over that very briefly. Let's start with gender stereotypes, male-dominated cult cultures, lack of female role models, math anxiety, and finally, the lack of support. So 
sorry. Sorry, so what might be the results of gender equality in STEM? STEM careers help narrow the gender gap, pay gap, diversity makes science better. You can make it less isolating and you, make, you can make the industry better. And the ways that might help closing the, the STEM gap, let's start with giving the girls and women the skills and confidence to succeed in math and science, improve STEM education and support for girls starting in early, in early education and through K-12, work to attract, recruit and retain women into STEM majors and fields in colleges and universities, improve job hiring, retention and promotion pathways and foster inclusive cultures. So this was a very brief global overview on the status of women in STEM fields. Nuria, please take it from here. Thank you so very much, Tamar, for this uh, informative exchange. And let us now hear from our guest speaker. So we're going to start uh, uh, with uh, Dr. Rashi Elkeles. Uh, she is the chairman of the National Council for the Advancement of Women in Science and Technology, operating under the Israeli Ministry of Innovation, Science and Technology. Uh, Dr. Rashi Elkeles volunteered for this position so she could harness her vast experience and passion to promote innovation to reach the Council's uh, goal which is enlarging the percentage of women's participation and representation in STEM. Dr. Rachel Kellis holds a PhD in human genetics from Tel Aviv University and has over 10 years of business experience uh, leading biotech and biohealth startups companies as founder and CEO. She founded and led several health tech companies pioneered the first femtech accelerator in the world, if femtech hub, and laid the foundation for the Israeli femtech ecosystem. So very, very welcome, uh, Dr. Rashi. It's really a pleasure to, to have you with us. And we leave uh, the, the microphone to you. So thank you. Thank you, Nuria. <clears throat> you uh, actually stole my uh, introduction. So I can uh, say that I have uh, a PhD in, in biotechnology. Yes. And uh, uh, before that, I would like to really stress that before everything, I'm excited in order to be here today to celebrate with all of you, the seventh uh, International Day of Women and Girls in Science. Actually, this day was set uh, seven years ago as a reminder that women and girls actually plays a critical role in science and technology communities and that their participation should be strengthened. As again, thank you, Nuria and Tamar, for inviting me. Um, let let me start again by introducing myself. And before everything, I would like to uh, say I'm a woman. I'm happily married. I have two sons and two brothers, no other woman around. So actually, uh, this is uh, one of the reasons, I think, why I found myself working in this uh, council of promoting women. Uh, as you mentioned, in my background, I hold a PhD in human genetics from Tel Aviv University and more than a decade in, in leading and managing academic studies at the university. Ten years ago, or something like that, I've decided to leave the academy and started my entrepreneurial chapter. I opened two startup companies and eventually founded a platform that aimed at uh, promoting startups in the femtech sector that indeed concentrates on, on women's health. And in October 2020, I was nominated as the chairwoman of the council. And since then, I'm trying to uh, fulfill this mission and promote as much as I can. The council was established 20 years ago following a governmental decision aimed at increasing the number of women that are practicing science and working in research and development. This step actually was part of a of the obligation that Israel took upon itself when joining the European R&D program that started early then in the back of the millennium. And back then the European Parliament realized that the point, that a key point in leveraging a knowledge intensive economy is increasing the number and quality of those that engage in the craft and promoting women, making them a bigger part of the STEM based industry was part of their solution, uh, um, um, actually uh, getting it. 
So the council's vision is to enhance the involvement of women in the fields of science and technology, and to bring about a continuous improvement of gender equality in criteria in these fields. And in order to do so, we uh, defined four major missions to coordinate the activity between all the bodies that work to promote women in science and technology here in Israel, including pu public, private, and non-for-profit organization, to support and initiate projects that promote women in education, academy, and industry, to collect data on the status of women engaged in science and technology in Israel in all three levels, education, academy, and industry, and to coordinate the Israeli activity within the EU with regards to uh, promoting women in science and technology. Our entire activities are planned and carried out by three committees. Actually, it's a three and a half because one of them uh, was getting a daughter committee. And each committee is directed to a specific stage in women's lifetime, education, academy, and industry. In the education committee, we try to decode how to encourage young girls to choose STEM education. In the academy committee, we work on ways to uh, elevate the numbers of women that uh, actually goes into the STEM faculties and increase the number of women with full professorship status and managerial positions. And in the industry committee, we seek to increase the number of women that sit in executive positions in the iTech, biotech, and health industries. The education committee oversees activities at all levels of formal and informal education. It collects data, it tracks trends on gender equality in education, it maps sources of inequality in education and encourages in initiatives uh, for the advancement of gender equality. And actually we coordinate between schools, informal education bodies, nonprofits and governmental bodies. One of our latest uh, achievements in this uh, committee was a report that uh, we did together with the SOLD Institute. Actually, this uh, report reviewed the global policies on gender equality in STEM, in STEM uh, education around the world. And you can find this report in our website, like all other reports. The Academia Committee oversees activity within the field of higher education, and this spans from undergraduate level to the highest level of professor. The committee collects data and tracks trends on gender equality in academia. It maps obstacles to women's advancement in the academia and coordinates between government uh, ministries and institutes of higher education. The committee is composed actually from representatives from all the institutes of higher education here in Israel, Tel Aviv, Adassa, Weizmann Institute, etc., research institutes and governmental bodies. And we are about to publish our newest report, which will be the snapshot of the gender equality studies in the Israeli Academy in years 2018 to 2019. Again, it will be published in our website. The industry committee is composed of representatives from numerous companies, professional organizations, and governmental bodies. This committee oversees activity within the business sector. And here, obviously, we collect data and track trends on gender equality in business. We map obstacles that the women face when trying to reach managerial, managerial positions in the private tech sector, and we coordinate between private industries, nonprofits, and uh, government bodies. Lately, we put emphasis on the unique subsector of women entrepreneurs. We try to identify the reasons for the lowest percentage of women involved in technological entrepreneurial activities. And we also try to find ways to uh, change it at the state level, not only uh, in a private level. Now, as I mentioned earlier, one of the Council's missions is to coordinate the Israeli activity with the EU with regards to promoting women in uh, research and innovation. And for that purpose, we participate in ERAC committees that manage gender equality within the European research area. ERAC is actually the EU's uh, strategic policy advisory committee on topics related to research and innovation. And uh, our participation in these meetings enables us to learn about the era policy from first sight and to publish it 
uh, here in Israel. Again, uh, we recently started the research regarding all the material that uh, was published in the last year, and we will publish it, uh, I, will, I believe, in, in two to three months. In the last couple of years, we participated in a committee called SWGGRI. It's a standing working group on gender and research and innovation. And actually, it advises the Council of the EU, the European Commission, and member states of the Council on the policies and initiatives that are related to gender equality. This advisory committee consists of representatives from all the member states and associated countries, which Israel is uh, one of them. And actually, this uh, working group was uh, helping to define the new demand of the Horizon Europe a program that all research and innovation institutes will activate a gender equality plan in their organization. Moreover, we uh, participate in, in consortiums that uh, are uh, funded by the European Commission. So the gender action was just uh, finished uh, a month ago, and we are about to start a new uh, consortium, the Gender Action Plus, and it will start uh, at, uh, in April. So most of the council's work is actually executed by volunteers that wish to come to promote gender equality and have a lot of experience and know-how in the committees that they, they belong to. Our budget is very low and, uh, and our tools are very limited. Nevertheless, I think we contribute in uh, three unique ways. First, we raise public awareness using tools like posting position papers, conducting webinars on the matter, and share everything we find fit uh, in our social media platforms. Also, we act, as I said, as a channel for the transfer of information between Israel and Europe, because not only we sit in their uh, committees and hear what is happening in Europe, we also give them some insights from what is happening in, here in Israel. And of course, we aim to be the source for data uh, in the subject. I would like to summarize my 10-minute uh, presentation and two decades of the Council's work with a somewhat optimistic tone. Yes, 20 years had passed since the Council was established, and unfortunately, women are still facing barriers to entry to the STEM fields and are still underrepresented in both the academy and industry. Nevertheless, we shouldn't lose hope because there are signs of changes in the air. There is a big uh, growing of movements, of number of movements and communities that are working to increase public awareness uh, of the imbalance. Governments start to acknowledge the problem and are willing to put efforts and funding uh, in order to uh, find the obstacles, the barriers and the solutions. And uh, even the private sector actually is, um, is uh, joining the effort. So um, I would like to uh, summarize that uh, on this International Day of Women and Girls in Science, I call everyone to create an environment where women can realize their true potential and today girls will become tomorrow's leading scientists and innovators, shaping a fair and sustainable future for all. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. It's really, really wonderful to hear all the different uh, work that the Council has been conducted over those decades and uh, that there is progress. There is uh, definitely something positive to take from this. Uh, thank you so much again. And uh, now we're going to hear from Professor Edith Shachar. Uh, Professor Edith Shachar earned her BSc, MSc and PhD from the Tel Aviv University. She conducted postdoctoral research at Yale University, a school of medicine. And upon her return to Israel, she joined the, the Weizmann Institute. She has served as the head of the Department of Immunology, as well as being the incumbent of the Dr. Dor Morton and Anne Clayman professional chair. Uh, in February 2021, she became the head of the Office for the Advancement of Women in Science and Gender Equality. Professor Shachar investigates molecular mechanisms underlying uh, lymphocyte maintenance in health and their malfunction in blood cancers such as uh, leukemia and myeloma, as well as the autoimmune diseases such as MS. 
uh, Professor Shahar has written numerous uh, peer review papers, reviews and, and book chapters. Her awards and honors include the Teva Prize for Excellence in Research, the Israel Science Foundation's Investigator Prize for the Advancement of Education in Science, and the World Foundation Award. Uh, she holds four uh, U.S. patents in the treatment and of inflammation and one for treating cancer. She has served as the president of the Israel Immunological Society and has been a board member of the American Association of Immunologists since 1998. Thank you so very much for being with us today. Uh, we would love to hear an, a little bit now from you, Professor. Uh, thank you. <laughs> it was funny to hear all this <laughs> introduction. So I'm Edith Chaha from the Department of Immunology. And as you said, I'm a, my lab re, a studies um, immune cells in health and disease. And since uh, February last year, I'm the head of the Office for Gender Equality. And um, we ca I came to this, um, to this position because I, I felt that uh, things are not going right. And actually the COVID time uh, made me feel even uh, that uh, the situation is worse than what we thought because uh, women suffered a lot and then women in academia suffered a lot. But because, be, before reaching this point, I want to show you, to share with you several slides showing, um, just let me see. Okay. So can you see? Yes, we yeah. can. Okay. So um, Israel is not in a good position uh, regarding the percent of women in science. If we compare the number of women scientists, uh, women, not even scientists, women, uh, sorry, um academic uh, uh women in academia in israel compared to the to europe we found that we are uh, almost uh, we we are one before the last uh, cyprus is the last one and we are after them and uh, while uh, most of europe the average in europe is about um um 40 percent uh, of uh, women scientists we are about half so the situation is not good and the question is why and if we compare the numbers in Israel, and this is in Hebrew, so I, 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 you, most of you cannot uh, understand what is written here, but this is the scissors uh, diagram uh, that shows uh, the number of women scientists in academia, in total in academia in Israel. And these are the numbers at the Weizmann Institute, and you can see there are not much, uh, the, there is not much difference. And actually throughout the world, this is the, the situation. What it shows is that, um, we have about 50% um, women students, MSc and PhD students. However, when we look at the numbers of uh, professors at the Institute, we see that the numbers uh, of women professors is really uh, low. Uh, and you can see that we are about 20% compared to the 80% of uh, main, male scientists. And uh, the numbers do not change so much throughout the years. And the, the question is why, because we have so many um, women PhD students and why we don't get them as uh, scientists in academia. And the, the, the answer is, is that this is a long track of being a PI. And there is a leak in the pipe, as you can see here, between the PhD level and the postdoctoral level. What it means is that um, we have, a, as I showed you, we have about 50% PhD student. However, the next step that is necessary for a, becoming a PI, oops, sorry, is there a problem? Okay. Do you see my presentation? Yes, yes, we can see okay. it. So, so the next step uh, for women uh, is to go abroad and to do the postdoctoral studies in an institute outside of Israel. And as you know, for men, 
Uh, this stage is not so difficult because usually um, the male scientist will tell the family, this is a very important stage in my career. I have to go and the family will go with them. For women, the situation is, is, is completely different because women has to, have to convince their, the spouse that um, they must come with them. And, and they should leave their job in whenever, wherever they are and, and go for furies abroad. And usually it's very, it is very difficult. And uh, in most of the cases, it doesn't occur. They, they, they do not approve and they don't go with them. And women stay um, in Israel. So this is a matter of education. Um, it's, you know, the, 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 the place of uh, women at home in most of the, in, in most of the families, we know that the, this is educational as, uh, level and, and we cannot convince so much women to, to fight for their rights. But we try to do our best to change the situation here. So we, what we are trying now to do is in order to, um, increase the number of women scientists, we have to, to work in different levels. And the first level is, first is to convince women to go abroad. And this we are doing it in the Institute by having um, different workshops that um, tell them and, and strengthen their, their, um, their uh, ability to, to admit that they were something and they, they should do this stage. Uh, the next step is to go abroad, and what they are doing abroad is uh, is complete is, is is not easy because uh, to do a postdoctoral studies abroad, you have to work very hard in a very strong competition. You have to um, to um, compete with other uh, scientists around you, and with scientists that want to go back to Israel. And actually, for women, competition is not a good. Um, um, a good thing for men, uh, they like competition and women um, are, are afraid or do not like to, to compete. And what we are trying now to do is to convince them that they were something, they, um, they should come back as, as a, a scientist to, to the academia. And we give them some tools to support them. We give them more money for staying abroad, we give them uh, some uh, um, uh, workshops by Zoom to convince them that uh, to, to work with them and give them tools. And we are trying to make connections, networking in Israel, in the academia, to make them feel better that uh, academia might be a good place for them. Um, the next step is once they come to Israel and they want to be a PI, and this is a very, you know, we are talking about low numbers of uh, women uh, scientists, but the, the one who choose this career, they also uh, confront very, uh, a lot of uh, problems like unconscious bias. Um, they, they, all the promotions levels are very difficult for, uh, for women, the, the, the criteria to become, to, to be promoted are uh, more relevant uh, for men rather than for women. And we have to change lots of rules in order to make them feel the, that they are in the right environment. We feel together that together all these uh, uh, steps might change the situation, but uh, this is a very long process. I believe that it will take time to have more scientists, women scientists in the academia. Um, I think um, that um, we sh it, it will take years and we should uh, measure and every year a, a very small change and we might we have to be happy with the small changes that we, are, uh, we might see. So let's hope that we will uh, succeed in this direction. No doubt, no doubt. With so many amazing women like yourselves uh, at the forefront, I'm sure that we're going to continue seeing great improvements in this field. Uh, I would like to now welcome uh, Dr. Irid Yaniv, uh, founder, partner, and CEO of Almeda Ventures. Dr. Yaniv has more than 25 years uh, of experience in the venture capital, pharmaceutical, and biotech industries. 
As a senior manager, a skilled physician, and experienced board member, she possesses a high developed combination of leadership, decision making, and business skills. Dr. Yaniv has served as a partner at Alcelmed Al since 2012, previously served as executive director and chairperson in Alcelmed Innovation Hub portfolio companies. Uh, she is also a co founder of We at Health Tech a program aiming to propel junior women managers to executive positions in the health tech sector by mentoring them and putting them through the eight month program of lectures and networking events. Uh, Dr. Yaniv holds a medical degree uh, from the Ben Gurion University and an MBA from the Recante Business Schools in Tel Aviv University. So it's really a pleasure to have you here with us. Dr. Janine, the thank microphone you. is all yours. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm uh, really excited uh, to be here. And uh, uh, you said everything about me, but uh, just to add uh, two things, uh, when I look back uh, into my history, uh, I would say my short history, because I plan to stay here a long, long time. Uh, I, I think that one of the uh, things that are highlighted in my uh, CV is that I like to make a change. And if I see an unmet need, I would like to change it. I would like to, uh, to bring something new to this world. And I will speak specifically in this uh, couple of slides about the issue of female or women in the, in the tech world, in the science world. So you said everything about myself and I am happy really to be here. And I, I think, sorry, it's not moving. Okay, I, I think uh, when I established Almeda and this was about 15 months ago, I was looking for, uh, for the name for this VC. And uh, of course, you know, there are so many names, so many generic names, but I insisted to have a female name uh, for this fund. I said, I am a female, I would like to have a female name and I would like to have a researcher name. And the, the topic and the importance was that I would like to make a path, a path to everyone that would like to succeed, every woman that would like to succeed. So after a, a huge research, uh, I found uh, this lady, Almeida, uh, June Almeida. She, le she lived in, Sco in uh, Scotland. She was a virology and nobody actually gave her any credit, uh, but she was the one that discovered the coronavirus in 1966. And because our fund was established in during the Corona time, I thought that this makes a perfect fit. And we actually named the fund Almeida, which is much easier for Israeli to say than Almeida. So this is, this is the start. And, uh, and from that, you can understand why uh, the topic of women in science is so important to me. And I would like to share with you a few slides that uh, we have prepared when we begin began to speak about uh, the program. There are a lot of noise. I don't know why, but someone can. Uh, so the sound when, of life. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Uh, so when we decided to establish the program of we at Health Tech. Uh, we wanted to pitch it to our colleagues and uh, to the participants. And uh, we found the following uh, figures uh, that I would like to share with you. And I think uh, it makes a lot of sense in this special day uh, to understand the fact uh, and then uh, try to figure out what to do. So there is a difference between high tech and health tech. Uh, in high tech, we don't see many women at a very low uh, a, a employment uh, position. However, in health tech, in science, in biology science, in medicine, we do see women. But 
look what happened when we reach the seniority level. The number, the percentage of women is almost the same. So it doesn't matter if I am a, if, if I am a board member in health tech company or I am a board member in high tech company, I will step into the room and will stay by myself at, uh, as, a, as the only woman in the room at the end of the day. So we have to take an action in two places. In high tech, we have to speak with the girls and uh, convince them to learn, to study, to be there in order to increase this number. In health tech, we have to target the women and try to push them in order to bring them to the seniority level. So we have two tasks in our life, and I'm very glad that this special day is actually combine the two parts, girls and women. We have to work in all fronts. What is more uh, stacking is when we look on the, on the companies itself and we look on the senior position, in the unicorn, we have only four women. So there are more than 27 or, or almost 30 unicorns in the world and only four women are leading them. In the VC partners, we have only 12% are part, women are partners. In the startup, we have only 8%. So there is a lot to do. And I fully agree with the speaker that spoke before of me. We are doing changes, very small changes, but we are doing, we are doing it right. When we look on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange, only two out of 60 uh, companies are See, the CEO is a woman. This is something that needs to be changed. Without a real change in those specific area, we are staying at the same place as we are. And why? There are many reasons. I, I, I'm sure that if I would give you a pen and a paper and everyone can write his own reason, you will write more than what I have here. But for me, we need, we need to start with Early, early age, but continue the all age process in order to make the change. So we have to make the change. And it is important because of uh, company valuation, company growth, better monitoring, question uh, and academic. In all aspects, it is important. And that's why at the end of the day, we have established the program that you spoke about it, Nuria, we at Health Tech. We, LF, we at Elftech is aiming to take junior position, junior position that hold by women that would like to make progress and give them the, the right tools, including inspiration, learning, and networking in order to take a senior position in the next one or two years. We have made two programs so far they were very successful. We have more than 30% of the women that took a, 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 the next level position and we are very proud of our uh, community, senior community of this program. And we are starting now with the third program that will take place in this year, 2022. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Irit. And uh, finally, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Shimrin Maman. Dr. Maman is a senior staff scientist in the Homeland Security Institute and director of the Earth Planetary Image Facility at the Ben Gurion University of the Negev. Her research deals with the application of satellite technologies to environmental challenges and climate change. She's an integral part of the research team leading B. Guzat, which is Israel's first research nanosatellite. Uh, she also serves as an expert and, head, uh, and heads the Israeli Regional Support Office of the United Nations Platform for Space-Based Information for Disaster Management and Emergency Responses. Previously, she served as the board member of DMARS and is founding board member of eSpace, a women's association promoting gender equality among Israeli STEM professionals. 
Dr. Shimri was appointed by the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs as a mentor in the Space for Women Network. Moreover, she is on the board of directors of the Ramon Foundation. Furthermore, she leads diverse education and outreach programs promoting science, technology, engineering, and maths using hands-on research activities at both the national and international scales, including the unique Should I take over? Because I think she froze. Yeah, okay, I'm just gonna take over, Nuria. <laughs> Thank you for that really kind and long introduction. I didn't realize you were gonna read the whole thing. Um, <laughs> well, the best thing about being last is that, first of all, everybody gave the introduction before me. And the second thing is that I have enough time to update my presentation according to what everybody said. So thank you so much for having me. And it's a great experience to be here. And um, my research deals with satellite technology. And as a Nat Schlein, Ambassador Nat Schlein said in the beginning of the presentation, and by, <laughs> by introducing that we want to bring women to the moon, then I'm just going to say we've been to the moon. We've been there with SpaceAL and the Israeli Space Agency and the IAI. We sent already Belichit, and we're now sending our second lunar uh, spacecraft, Belichit uh, 2. And this is a special time to introduce this um, specifically on this day, uh, because I have a very special connection to Belichit. Um, my satellite, BGUSAT, that was introduced by Nuria a second ago, is actually celebrating today five years in space. Now, when we're talking about a nano satellite, sometimes it's not so um, easy to imagine what's a nano satellite. Belichit is relatively a small spacecraft, but mine is even smaller. This is how small it is. So this is a nano satellite that we launched five years ago, and we're very proud of that. And that gives us the ability to also collaborate with Space AL because our heritage using this satellite was, was implemented in this, the, in the Belichit spacecraft. And I'm going to put a link uh, later on at, at the end of my talk to a, a designed scholarship for women provided by Space AL that everybody should attend to. So most of uh, the speakers just before me already said the numbers are low, okay? We are too few women and I'm not going to repeat that, but this is true also for space sciences worldwide. But there's also a personal motivation. And my personal motivation came in the form of my child, Yuval. When um, my, the fun parts of my job is that I get to host astronauts over in Israel. And she always said, mommy, you always bring male astronauts. It took me a while to understand that's what she was saying because she was five. And then I said, okay, we're going to have an all women panel this was 2016, and we brought over Dr. Shannon Walker, which is a uh, NASA astronaut, and we started discussing women in space. And following this, uh, we had a lot of discussions in the lab, following both our satellite and our technology, and we said, okay, this can't be. You walk into a room, it's 2016, and as Irit said, uh, you're still the only woman. The, the only woman in the womb. The, the something, we have to change that. So we came up with a program that is called She Space. And She Space does something different. Instead of just giving a talk, we said, okay, let's change the, the concept. Let's bring the girls into the lab. Let's show them what we're actually doing. So we took climate change, SDG 13, as a framework. And we said, the girls are going to answer climate change questions, but they're going to use space applications. So this way they get also the science, but also the technology. And as we are targeted, targeting STEM, this was the perfect framework for us. And the thing is, is that because the program is already international, we ask the girls to use local satellites and maintain the national level. But because we're acting on a global, topic of climate change, we wanted to show them that 
that this is something that doesn't happen in your in, within the political borders of your country. And we wanted to allow them to experience the global perspective. And by doing so and interacting with the different gir uh, girls worldwide, they get the science, the technology, the gender issues as well, even though that's not a part of the program. It's not a stated part of the program. It's not a lesson in the program, but you just get it naturally. So we started off first in Israel and in the second year, um, we already expanded to Germany, uh, Brazil, United States. And last year we had a program that we expanded more to eight countries and Peru and Togo and uh, Spain and South Korea joined. And yesterday, if you were watching on Facebook, we also opened the fourth iteration of She Space, and we also have the Ivory Coast joining us this year in the program. So we're already operating with this for the first year and having girls conduct research. And this was way cooler before the, the, the pandemic because the VC conferences were actually um, a highlight. Now everybody's on Zoom and it's we're all fed up with that already. And by doing so, they do get this global perspective of geography, generation, and gender. And most of our staff is female and female professionals. That, this way, they get a sense of role models, but not just high-end role models, not just PIs or uh, directors or very successful women that already paved the way and are at the top of the career. They're, they're working with all our, science, our staff from the beginning, the bachelor, the bachelor degree, master degree, and PhD degrees. And then they work with the staff as well, seeing the whole, the, the whole way they could see, they could really imagine just by being with us in the lab and just by experience, uh, experiencing us, they could really get a sense of what they could become. So this project is STEM oriented and using different satellite data from different countries, they do get a sense of multi-dimensional data and different sensors, but then they get also the algorithms for detection and classification of the different phenomena that they are investigating themselves. And apart from just learning the theory, it's very important to us to have hands on and have the girls touch the equipment and operate thermal cameras and the satellites and drones and everything that they could um, ex gain the experience in order to build their self-esteem and confidence. Later on, they are requested to present their work internationally to all the groups and they have to go through the whole process. And by doing so, they gain so much um, not just not just research experience, but they get soft skills and they understand what it's like to present before the, the different crowd, but they have it all in a very safe, all girl environment mode. And by doing so, we are targeting some of the United Nations SDGs. These are our, these are, uh, our general framework that we are trying to follow towards 2030. We are targeting quality education and gender equality. And of course, climate action that is such an important thing to not only, um, not only scientists, but also to these young children that are changing the world. And when you have such a great example, such as Greta Thunberg, who is actively changing our world, these girls could see what they could become not just when they're in their 30s or 40s. And of course, we have partnerships for the goals because nowadays you cannot achieve a lot of things alone. These girls are later acting as our ambassadors for both STEM and, and space sciences. And uh, I'm very proud of the entire team and the girls that are taking part because this is something that is usually a um, achieve when you're in your master's or your PhD and they're conducting this at such a young age. 
of 14, 15, 16, and 17. And that's amazing. So thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. And, um, and I hope in the future, we won't need these special days, but currently it's a great way to raise the awareness and act towards the change. Thank you. I couldn't agree more, Shimrit. Thank you so much for all of your four presentations. And uh, we're going to start with a few questions as uh, we're moving on with the time. Um, and of course, we've already been discussing throughout your presentations about uh, what factors uh, limit the women's participation. I think you all actually touch upon it. Um, but we wanted to ask you, what objectives do you believe must be set to encourage more participation of women and girls in STEM? Uh, and I open the microphone to any of you who would like to answer that question. I think no, Sharon. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Sharon. Yes, I might as well uh, start. So I think that um, I, I'm a scientist, so I usually count on facts. So I went to the uh, UNESCO uh, website and looked for the, you know, the numbers, and I thought maybe the objective should be uh, related directly to the. Uh, to the um, to the facts, I see that less than thirty percent of researchers employed in R and D globally are women. So maybe the first objective will be uh, to see how can we uh, enlarge this number and um, you know what can be done in in a state level in order to uh, to draw more women to be researchers. The other thing is that women in STEM field publish less than their men colleagues. Let's let's check why. Let's check if this is something that has to do with the with them being women, or is it something that uh, has to do with the past that they are going through and and uh, related directly to the um, to the fact that actually uh, they they give birth, so um, their their course is a bit delayed, and that is why they publish less. So maybe there there should be something that can fix it. Okay, uh, another thing is that uh, women are paid less for the research in the academy, so this is something that we should, should definitely seek to, uh, to change. And um, moreover, women and girls enrollment in university STEM courses is much lower than their male counterparts. This is again, something that we should uh, seek to change. And um, one, one big uh, objective that I see is uh, actually find a way to change the tracking of young girls uh, during, um, during the, the educational phase, during the, them being in, in, in high school, to find the way to, uh, to give them more tools to, um, to be involved in, in, in technological uh, courses, um, to give them more opportunities to, uh, to learn, and therefore more opportunities to be involved in, in, in the army later on in, in units that has to do with the uh, technological um, uh, fields. Thank you. I don't know if anybody else would like to add anything. Otherwise, we've got plenty of other questions <laughs> to, to go around. That I, I would say um, one, of the, one of the things that you all touch upon is the fact that we as women uh, have our own challenges when it comes to you know, motherhood, we have to take time off, we have to be with our children and so on. And I think this is one of the issues in society is that the women have to be able to succeed as women with everything that it implies, which is always something that has been left behind. And that brings me to the, to the following question is, what do you think about having affirmative action or quotas put into place for women postdoctorates or PhD candidates, etc.? Uh, so I, I can answer. I think it's a bad idea um, because always we will be considered as less good, and uh, and and we uh, people around us will always remember that we that women were chosen 
based on, on, the, on the actions that were made. So I think we have to be as good or even better than the men, uh, but we, we should have the right environment for our success. Definitely the right environment, that's for sure. Yeah. So I put in a- I absolutely agree with Edith. Uh, I, I think water is, very, is a very bad idea. And uh, I would like to see that we have a very large pool of women that we can choose and select and identify the right ones. And if we have this, we don't need a quota because there will be a competition on the, on the seats and not, uh, uh, so we just have to make sure that we have enough women in all level and in all positions that we can always identify the right one for the panel, for the PhD, for the academic postdoc or whatever uh, position we need. Okay. Easier said than done. Well, we struggle a lot to find ways to to uh, to do it. And uh, if you have suggestions, then uh, we might as well uh, get together and hear what you have to say. Because it's not that easy. Even even if you look at the uh, innovation authority and uh, the number of uh, women that uh, got funded for their uh, startups, the number is is not that much. It's not big, yeah, but but no. that's what we are trying to do right now: is to increase the numbers, is to take, is to help them decide to go in the right direction. Once we have a, a larger pool, we will be able to select from this larger pool. But we have to work on their education, as you do. We have to work on their uh, on 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 the family environment and to support them with uh, with money or maybe tools to be able to do the the steps. But but not. You know, once we do the mistake and choose women based on the, or the gender, we, we, women will suffer forever. And I will, I, I, will give you, I will give you another tip in order to make it happen, uh, Sharon. Uh, one of the things that is very, is very difficult is because women are not there. They are, they are very good women that knows, know how to speak, how to pitch, how to lecture, how to uh, be directors or whatever, but nobody knows them because they are not uh, networking, they are not putting, and we know that we usually don't put our name uh, ahead of the others, we are trying to be aside. This is our nature. So what I suggest is to, to make lists of speakers, of investment bankers that are women, because when you need one, you go to the list and pull one. And then you don't have to remember. And I had this problem just early this week. Someone called me and said, there is a panel on investment banking and all of them are men. This is impossible. I'm not, I cannot let it, I cannot do it. So the first uh, answer that I had was, but you know, this is a, a male uh, dominant field. So there are, not, there are not too many women. So let's leave with that. And she said, no, 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 I'm, I'm not willing. You have to, figure out at least two investment bankers that are women. And then I went to my list and I went to my network uh, cardex and I found one, found two actually, and, and she was happy. So there is an issue to discover them and to bring them to the front. And what I suggest to all of us, each of us in our field is just make, make lists of those women that can be speakers, that can sit on panels and let us that are there push the others. Let us make the crowd. Once we have the crowd, we will make it happen. So um, I must add that uh, the council being the, the body that wants to, you know, uh, centralize everything is actually uh, can be the body that uh, collects all the data, but we don't know how to reach everything. So maybe we, we should have vectors like, because not everything should be uh, done again and again and again by, by, uh, by you know, by individuals. Maybe we as I, a, a national uh, body can, I, can I, centralize I think, it. Yeah, I, I would be happy to collaborate and give you, you know, some, uh, topics of our lists 
and let's let's make it happen. Uh, yes, and we, can, we can publish it in our website because we are now uh, building a new website and we will uh, reserve a place to such kind of lists. I, uh, I welcome you on that and I appreciate that you are taking the, the ball and, and make it happen. And I think this will help us to, to bring more women to the right places. Nobody will forget us. Can I comment as well? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was just being polite. But, um, <laughs> well, <laughs> every, well, I have to say that, uh, first of all, I'm going to pick up on each and one of you, of whatever you said, because I agree with all of you and I don't agree with all of you at the same time, okay? Uh, the thing is, is like this. I agree with it because we had the same problem in space and in, spa and in the space conferences, we had the problem, especially in Israel, that every time they said, we don't have enough women spacers and there's not enough women dealing with space sciences, uh, space sciences in general. And then it became a thing that most of the women that were, were very repeating themselves. It's the same women all the time. And they're usually just moderators, which is a harder job in my opinion. So what we did is we established uh, a women's association. It's called We Space, Women in Space Israel. And we already have uh, over 150 professional women that we know of in order to supply that list too. But it doesn't end only with that list because we do need later on to pick up and support these women and encourage this, these women. And, I'm, and I relate to it as well and say, okay, personally, as a woman, I would hate to know that I was awarded something just because I'm a woman. But I think it's a necessary stage, especially where we are now. And, and this is where I agree with Sharon. We have to act in all, all our available tools. And this is a, le a legitimate tool to act upon. It's very important for us. And this is why we have designed scholarship for women because sometimes, and some crowd, it wouldn't work for me or Edith or, or Edith, but it would work for different women that need that separation or that need that special encouragement. So if it works for them, it's a blessing in my opinion. And my last comment is that the issue has to be supported with men. Just by looking, just by looking at the audience, I see Emmanuel and Nissan. I did not pick up on any other men in this um, in this Zoom meeting. We cannot do this alone. This is not a women versus men issue. We have to work together as a society. So, if you have. I agree and disagree. <laughs> you have the benefit to be the last one. <laughs> yeah, I said. What, what is nice is that it's, some, it's not just a discussion, it's also an opportunity for networking. So I really appreciate the, this, this uh, session. Um, and it reminds me as well a little bit of what happens with us here in our center, because it was instituted for women and promo for promoting women's rights and and uh, empowering them. And to today, I mean, 2025, in the 21st century, we still have some time to fight to make sure that the, the candidates are balanced, that, that we receive the right amount of applicants to come into our courses and, and to our activities and so on. And, and many times we find that our embassies send us too many male candidates and we have to write back and ask them to please look in the same sector, in the same field and find, find us women because we know that they are out there. And uh, so, so it, it is very interesting what you're saying, and we certainly appreciate the discussion. Um, I would like to ask uh, my colleague Tamar, I think she might have some more questions from uh, our audience. Actually, our audience do not have any questions, but I do have a, a very basic question that I would li like to ask you all. Whether you had a role model that affected you, that have uh, you saw her and you said, "Wow, I want to be a scientist." Uh, I must 
say that uh, once I was younger, I didn't even know that uh, there's a gender issue. I was living with uh, the notion that uh, everything is good and, you know, I'm equal to everybody else, sometimes superior, <laughs> but, um, but I, I know for a fact that uh, there are not enough role models for women, for young girls. So maybe this is something that we need to, uh, to emphasize more on, on the education level. Yeah, I, I agree somehow with Sharon. I, I, I think for myself and maybe all of us that made it, we didn't feel that there is an issue of, uh, of gender. That's why we are there uh, in, in a way, because uh, we, we had an opportunity, we took it and, and we moved forward and our environment, our family, our environment in general and our family uh, environment in specific uh, gave us the opportunity because they also didn't feel that there is a gender issue. But there is a gender issue. And as I said, I, we are in the, age, in the year of 2022 and I'm still can spend a full day without seeing another woman in, in, the, in the level that I am. I am maybe the secretary or uh, the personal assistant that uh, is doing work for us. Uh, and I think this has to be changed. And this is why we that did it have to act as role model, inspiration, mentors, whatever, however you call it, it doesn't matter. We just have to pitch more and more girls and, and daughters that this is possible. They don't have to give up. They just have to find and to build for themselves the right environment. They have to choose the right husband. They have to uh, speak with the family and, 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 uh, and give the, the knowledge to their parents if their parents are not uh, advanced enough, but they have to do it and uh, they can do it because we, if we could, they can as well. And this is what I said to my daughter every day. So oh, I, I yeah. no, sorry, did it? Yeah, no, go ahead. No, no, it's fine. I, I'm sorry to for interrupting you, but I, I, I felt it a little bit different. So at the beginning in my early career and when I was a PhD student and then when I was a postdoc, I didn't realize that there is any difference between men and women. And I thought that, you know, this is something belong to the past. Um, but when I came back to Israel and I started to have my own lab, um, I started to feel that there's something different because I started to realize, oh, my dog is starting to barking, sorry. <laughs> I started to Dinah, I started to realize that uh, something is going on and and the, um, and I felt it very strong and I think most of the women in our institute felt it very strong when uh, in the promotion to to the top level a full professor that is a very you know the highest level and the criteria for being a full professor are not so much you know, it, it, you know, it's something that is is not strict. You have to, you have to uh, be a um, a, um, a recognized in the world. What does it mean to be recognized? It's something that can be interpreted, and actually, women suffer a lot at this stage. So I think in academia still we are not equal, and uh, the promotion levels are not equal for men and women, and I. And this is something that we really try to change nowadays. Sorry for the my dog. Sorry. Totally okay. Thank you very much. Yes, opinion. <laughs> yeah, I got excited. So we yeah. have a question that is related to this topic from a, um, our participant who's asking how how can we create more opportunities for jobs in STEM fields? I think the opportunities are there. We just need more women to fill in the opportunity. You know, we, every job that I am post for my fund, I always ask to bring me at least one candidate from each of the genders, uh, that the top candidates. So uh, I think the jobs are there. We are posting jobs uh, all over the LinkedIn, Telegram, there are so many forms and opportunities. And I think what we have to do is encourage the, everyone to, to submit an application. Don't feel that you are not 
uh, qualified. If you feel that this is the job for you, just fight for it. I, uh, that's what I have uh, to say. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um, I would like to ask one more question. Um, you mentioned earlier, the, all of you, that they traveling abroad and, and, and uh, doing different research or PhDs or so on. Uh, so how does it compare a little bit your experience here in Israel to the experience that other women scientists have uh, in other countries? And if you do to this day is keep connections and, and still network with them. I'll go. I, I can <laughs> say, yeah, uh, Shimrit, go ahead. You first. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> uh, I, I don't mind going last. <laughs> it's okay. No, it's okay. Um, well, I, I find it very similar in all places. And this is something we also see in the She Space program. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. Um, women, the minute they're few, they feel alone. So one way to overcome that is to make your own network and your support net uh, in order to overcome that. And the second issue that everybody struggles with, not everybody, whoever chooses to be, is uh, around motherhood, especially when the kids are young. And that's a very uh, challenging stage. And we saw this, and I could see that from my colleagues worldwide um, as well, um, especially during the COVID pandemic we were thrown back in time. The feeling is that a lot of women just went back to traditional motherly um, uh, roles, I will call it. And most of my friends and colleagues would say, I stayed home with the kids and I did this, especially young kids. My kids are a bit older, so it was easier for me. I didn't feel that as well. It was challenging at first to have everybody at the house, but when you have little kids, and very little, I'm not talking just babies, but at the ages of three, four, five, six that still need your attention and they're not fully independent, that was a hard thing. Um, and most of us did overcome that uh, with our support network. I could tell you that in my personal lab and what we're doing in the Earth and Planetary Image Facility is we're adjusting the times for mothers. So if somebody has to be um, all day with the kids and she wants to work at night, go ahead. If you want us on Fridays, I'm there, <laughs> whatever you want. I will adjust myself in order, um, and so will my other colleagues, and, and I've seen this a lot in Bangalore universities, everybody was very supportive and we should form that uh, sense uh, of support. Uh, I, I want to clarify something. So usually, Women postdocs, Israeli women postdocs, go abroad with children, while most of the uh, women around the world do not have children at this stage of life. So I think uh, Israeli postdocs uh, suffer or feel the situation worse because, because they have to struggle in the family and in their uh, universities. So the situation is much more difficult for uh, Israeli scientists. And I can shed some uh, insights regarding the uh, entrepreneurial sector. As uh, lately, recently, we uh, just uh, collaborated with several countries from abroad, from India, from Australia, etc. And we saw that the situation is quite similar in, in all the other countries. And usually they seek answers from us as we are perceived that the startup nation and they think that uh, the number of uh, female entrepreneurs, female technological entrepreneurs in Israel is much higher than in other places in the world. But this is not the case. We, are, uh, we have exactly the same number of uh, women entrepreneurs like everywhere, everywhere else. And the only thing that is uh, different is that uh, I think we are um, a bit more aware of, of this uh, entrepreneurial sector here in Israel. So maybe that would be a, a jumping point for us. Thank you so much. Um, another quick question. Um, what would you say was the 
best bit of advice that you actually received throughout your career? I would start this time because it's, it is the advice that I'm still giving my daughter. Whenever you step into a room, when you leave it, make sure that they know that you were there. So, uh, and I, I think if you think about it, never go into the room and be quiet or sigh. Always say something that they will remember you on, on a positive note, of course. <laughs> but uh, this is the advice that I got from my mother-in-law and I'm still giving it to my daughter. Fantastic. There you go. Got good relationship with the mother-in-law. Edith, you wanted to say something, sorry. Me? Um, I, I, I think that uh, my advice is to my daughter is to be as close to as she can, uh, as she can be to, to herself and do whatever she likes. And if she feels she wants to go to do something, she needs to do it. And if she feels that something is, uh, is uh, her aim, she needs to follow it. Uh, and uh, that's the only thing that I can advise her because I think most of us are not following our uh, dreams. Yes, I wanted to say, yes, ah, sorry, ah, Sharon. Okay. No, 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 Sharon, wanted... please go ahead and then we'll uh, take uh, Shimrit. I wanted to say, uh, yes, go ahead, pursue your dream, but then Shimrit just said it. So I'll just um, mention something that I heard recently uh, from, a, from a young woman. She said, whenever I'm entering a room and it's full with men and I stand there alone, I'm telling to myself that I'm not alone. All the 50% of the world population is behind me. All the women in the world. And then I'm coming in. That's nice. Yeah. I like that one. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it's true. Um, I, I agree and I relate to Elite and Edith and Sharon. And uh, I would say, I would give an advice that I took is just try. Just take the time to try things, to really try them. Because until you don't experience it fully, you don't get a sense of what it really is. And most of, um, most of the women actually stop at the stage before they even try. So just try it. Don't like it, move on. Like it, yay. <laughs> Fantastic. I really take that on board. And then um, on the opposite side of the coin, what would be the worst piece of advice that you actually received throughout your career? <laughs> Don't try. <laughs> Don't try, okay. <laughs> Stay, stay behind and stay quiet. Stay quiet. Wow. Yeah. And I just entered a, a room of investors with my first startup. One of the men there was asking me, what do you have to do with just a, a pretty girl like you? Go, do something with your life. Why do you have to struggle your way up? So th this was a, a very bad advice. Don't go into men world or yeah. don't go into this uh, scene. Nuria, there's actually another question at the chat that I would love to address. If that, uh... Please, 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 please okay, go ahead. Uh, it, well, somebody asked what to do, uh, what do you suggest teachers to do with students at high school to motivate them about science studies? Then uh, this is a great advice that I got from uh, Dr. Deganit Paikovsky. She's from the Hebrew University. And she said, when you go into a room, and especially with teachers, encourage them to be proactive with girls. And I was holding myself and saying, what do you mean? It's like, encourage the girls to ask. And if they don't ask, just turn to them by name and say, hey, Irit, please answer that question. Even if they didn't raise their hand. Okay, just be proactive. And it would change the whole thing. And I did take that advice. I could tell you that um, I, I implemented it on my uh, on some of my female uh, <laughs> students because um, the males would usually be, do you want to go to a conference abroad? And they would go, yay, yay, yay. But my female students would say, wait, I have to check who's going to take care of the kid. So I just stopped asking. And I said, you have to go. And it works like magic. They go. 
<laughs> they just do it. So um, be proactive with your female students. That would help. Love that. Any other comments? Okay, I think uh, we're actually running out of time. And I know that you're all very busy. And I know Dr. Sharon, she has another appointment that she has to go to. So uh, I would like to thank very, very much everybody for participating. If anyone needs any extra information throughout the session, please, you can still write in the chat your email address. And we'll only be too happy to get back to your, to your questions later on. So I thank all our panelists today. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you this afternoon. I hope to hear good news about this new collaboration. And <laughs> it might turn up from this. And I'd like to thank very, 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 very much my colleague Tamar and obviously our director, Sarah Wilner, that they're here with us today. And our ambassador, Inait Schlein, for her support and all our activities. And for the rest of you participants, uh, thank you so much again. Uh, for being here with us, for us, throughout all of this time of craziness online, and hopefully we'll be having you back on our center very, very soon. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was very nice. Bye. Have a nice Thank evening. you so much. Bye. Thank Bye. you all. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Uh, bye bye. It has been nice to Hi, Nuria. Bye. It's lovely to see you. Thank you so much, everybody, for being with us. Thank bye you. bye. 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 <laughs>